Okay, good morning everybody. After an uh, excellent, um, excellent keynote, uh, I think we should move on as time is uh, flying to the next session. And um, my name is Gudrun Massmann. I'm gonna model the first part of it. And then um, Rudi, uh, will, uh, Rudi Osello will, uh, will moderate the second part of it after the coffee break. Um, we have, okay. it's, I don't know, okay. Um, could the fourth speaker maybe identify um, him or herself from India? Sorry, number four? Okay, okay. So everybody's there, so we really should get started. Well, I'd like to, so we will have a, I think we'll have an excellent session on modern modeling and uh, Emil Kruistig <laughs> from the Netherlands is gonna uh, start with push-pull test modeling. All right, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Emil Kruistig, I'm uh, doing a PhD at uh, TU Delft on the Achima project. Um, and today I will tell a little bit about uh, uh, a method we use, uh, push-pull tests and reactive transport modeling combined uh, to study water quality changes. And this is used uh, to study water quality changes in an ASR system. And on the figure here you see the location of the, the ASR system, it's an agricultural uh, system. And I will first show how this system is uh, working with a small animation. Um, so if it's raining in the Netherlands, it mostly uh, happens in the, in the winter times. Um, to control the groundwater levels in the Netherlands, we have drainage pipes in the, in the subsurface. And those drainage pipes are normally discharging uh, extreme precipitation events to the surface water system. Uh, in this system, we collect the drainage, drainage water and the fresh part of this drainage water, we, um, we collect, we filter it, and we bring it into the subsurface. Uh, we are in a coastal area, so the groundwater is uh, saline to brackish, so we create like a fresh water bubble in the, in the subsurface. During summer, we can abstract this water again, we can add fertilizers if we want, and we can use the water again for the irrigation of the, of the flower bulbs in this case. Um, this is a section a few of the, uh, the, AS, of, of the setup. So we have, at one side, we have the, the ASR setup with four partially penetrating wells. And uh, at one meter distance, we have three monitoring wells uh, where we did uh, our research. And on, the, on this locations, we also took sediment samples uh, for geo, geochemical uh, characterization and aquifer characterization. And those monitoring wells are placed in three uh, different layers with different, uh, uh, in different ge ge uh, geological formations with different uh, aquifer characteristics and different uh, geochemical characteristics. Uh, so the research questions, uh, the, the water that we infiltrate into the subsurface contain, uh, contain fertilizers, contain nutrients. So the question of this research was, uh, what happens with those nutrients in the subsurface? What is the fate of the nutrients? And do we see any differences on those different layer scale with different, uh, on this, in these different uh, geological uh, formations? Um, and we use uh, push-pull tests and uh, we're cou coupled with reactive transport modeling uh, to, to find this out. Uh, normally, uh, push-pull tests uh, focus on, on rate constants, uh, but we are most interested in the processes that, that are happening and on understanding those processes. Uh, and that's why we uh, uh, went for the, as we, uh, as we think the first time, uh, for a combination of push-pull tests and reactive transport modeling. So I will first uh, show uh, the method, explain the method a little bit. Uh, a push-pull test is a sort of a mini uh, ASR system. So we can infiltrate uh, a small amount of, mother, of water into the subsurface, uh, which flows radially outward of the, of the monitoring well. And uh, during the abstraction phase, we will abstract the water in different, different parts. So in this case, there, there are uh, six parts. And if we start abstracting, we will first abstract the first uh, part and then, uh, then so on. Uh, if we abstracted the total volume that we infiltrated, uh, we go on a little bit so that we, uh, we can abstract all the, the, the compounds that we uh, uh, infiltrated to complete the, the mass balance. 
Um, so we have uh, all these water samples of different uh, times, and we can analyze those water samples, we can study the changes, and we can uh, come up with a hypothesis of the, uh, the processes that are happening, and we can study that with a reactive transport model. Uh, the reactive transport model that we used was uh, FreakC. Uh, FreakC is based on a, a database, a terminal dynamical database uh, filled up with some kinetical reactions. Um, the case study, the ASR system. Uh, the, the ASR system is located in uh, the north of the Netherlands, in, in Bresant, which is close to, uh, close to Den Helder for the people uh, that are known in the area. Uh, the compounds that we are looking at are mostly uh, nitrate and phosphate, so the most uh, used uh, nutrients for fertilizing the, the ground. Uh, we had a time span of 12 days. We infiltrated 360 liters and we, uh, on the first day, and we abstracted every day 60 liters for 12 days, which sums up uh, uh, to an abstracted volume of 720 liters. Uh, this is done in three piezometers, and after uh, the test, the water samples were analyzed with uh, real-time sensors, ion chromatography, isot PMS, and discrete analyzer. So the first step after we, uh, we, we got uh, the, the, the water quality analysis was to determine the mixing that was occurring in, uh, during the, the push-pull test. So uh, we, we added the conservative tracer, which was bromide. And as you see in this, this figure, with, with, with on the uh, y-axis the concentration uh, in millimol per liter, and on the x-axis the, the time that passed in, uh, in days, and below the abstracted volume divided by the injected volume. So after, uh, if the abstracted volume divided by the injected volume is one, we abstracted the total amount of water that we infiltrated. Um, so the blue dotted line is the concentration of bromide of the infiltrated water, and the, the uh, black dashed line is the uh, concentration of bromide in the groundwater. So if there would be no mixing occurring, we would expect uh, a breakthrough curve like this. But of course, the, of course there is some, some dispersion uh, occurring. So what we saw, these blue dots are the observed concentrations. We saw a nice breakthrough curve of the bromide concentrations over time. Um, this line we used as a, as a no reaction line as bromide is a conservative tracer. And with this line we determined the, the dispersion coefficient and we used this coefficient to, to calculate for every compound a, a line where, uh, where no reactions are occurring, which is shown as the, as the green dashed line in the following figures. Uh, the next step was to compare the no reaction line with uh, the observed concentrations that we saw. So for this uh, example, we have the, the oxygen and nitrate concentrations. Both, uh, yeah, uh, both uh, can be, uh, yeah, can be uh, yeah, found in uh, redox uh, processes. So what we see here in the first uh, figure, we see uh, the no reaction line, the, the green dashed line, but we see that the observed concentration, the blue dots, are way lower than the no reaction line. So we see that our reactions occurring uh, uh, that decrease the oxygen concentrations. Uh, we see the same at the nitrate concentrations, but with a lower, with a lower rate. So we, we know that our reactions are occurring, but we still don't really know what kind of reactions. Uh, so we start to uh, come up with some hypotheses. And the most common processes for these compounds, uh, at least in the Netherlands, are pyrite oxidation, organic matter oxidation, and iron oxidation. Uh, pyrite oxidation leads uh, these the the, the uh, reaction, reactions here are, are simplified to uh, make it a little easier. But uh, pyrite oxidation leads to a higher sulfate concentration. Uh, iron oxidation leads to lower uh, iron concentration due to the precipitation, uh, precipitation of the to, to of iron hydroxides. So we we looked if we could saw that in the in in our uh, uh, observed concentrations, and we see uh, increased concentration of sulfate, which implies that uh, probably pyrite oxidation is, is occurring, and we see the same for our iron oxidations or iron concentrations, which are uh, yeah lower than than uh, the reaction line. So there is uh, some some probably some uh, precipitation of iron hydroxides happening. Uh, the next step was to uh, look if this hypothesis could be, uh, could be modeled in the reactive transport model. And as you can see the fit of the, the red line, the red line is the simulated, uh, are the simulated concentrations. Uh, the fit is really quite, quite good with the uh, observed concentrations. So we, um, 
it gives uh, the idea that uh, the, our hypothesis is, uh, could, be, could be correct. Um, uh, by using the reactive transport model, we can uh, go one step further and we can uh, see uh, which kind of, uh, we, we made like electron balance to see which processes are most important. And on the left side, you see the, the, the middle, uh, middle monitoring well. And on the right side, you see the deep monitoring well. Due to some, some groundwater flow, we didn't have good uh, observations of, the, of the, the, shallow, the shallow well, so we only have those uh, two push-pull tests. And what we see is that in the, the middle uh, monitoring well, the, the major reaction that was occurring was uh, organic matter oxidation. Uh, but instead, in the monitoring well three, in the deep uh, monitoring well, the, the, the most common uh, process was pyrite oxidation. Uh, the same we did for, for phosphate. And I go to this a little, a little faster. Uh, our hypothesis was that we would have uh, iron precipitates or calcium precipitates which would lead to a decrease of the, pyrite, of the phosphate concentrations. Um, and we, we modeled that. And um, as you can see in the, in the figures, there is a quite uh, good, um, yeah, the trend is quite the same between the simulated concentration and observed concentrations. So phosphate is, is uh, precipitated and absorbed uh, to, to uh, iron hydroxide and calcium hydroxide. Um, so we again made a phosphorus a balance to see what, uh, which processes are occurring in the different wells. Uh, in the middle well, we see that uh, the precipitation of calcium phosphates was the most uh, important reaction. And in the deeper well, we again saw diff a different reaction, and that was the, the precipitation of, of iron phosphates. So I think the results were uh, quite, quite interesting, and we see some, some fu future um, uh, we, we think that uh, push-pull test uh, reactive transport modeling uh, could be helpful in future, future Mars studies, uh, mainly for three, three things. Exploration of new sites. So if you want to uh, understand what, what kind of processes you can expect on a new Mars site, you could, you could use this, this method. Um, you get a better understanding of the processes, and you, you get a, also a better idea on the, the, on, on the specific data of the different layers. So we, you can decide on uh, infiltrating uh, in those layers or maybe not if it's uh, not beneficial. And in the end, it's a, it's a cheap, fast, and quite easy method uh, to, to gain a lot, of, uh, a lot of knowledge. So conclusions. Uh, the push-pull test reactive transport model was successfully applied, uh, but then only in the, in the, two, bottom, in the two bottom wells. The push-pull test showed a relatively fast reduction of oxygen and nitrate and immobilization of phosph uh, phosphate. And uh, by using the reactive transport model uh, to, uh, to check the push-pull test, we got a better insight in the reaction, in the reactions that were occurring. And it, uh, we got a better insight in the different uh, processes that were occurring in the, in the different layers. Um, for more information, um, there are a couple of uh, presentations uh, next to me that are uh, also uh, using this, the same kind of sy systems. Uh, on the poster end, there are two posters which are focusing on the, the MAR and agricultural areas and the monitoring of those systems. Uh, Karina Eisfeld will uh, explain a little bit about the fate of uh, plant pathogens during uh, these type of systems. And uh, Risa Latrafique will use uh, push-pull tests uh, to, uh, yeah, see to in, in Bangladesh to see what, what happens with uh, arsenic concentrations in the subsurface. And uh, that, was, that was it, and uh, I hope that there are any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, and thanks for an excellent talk and keeping uh, to the time. So I think we have time for questions. A great talk, and uh, do you do something about uh, mass recovery in the end of your push-pull test, and uh, what's the mass recovery rate of oil test. Sorry, uh, uh, I mean, in the end, did you pumping out do the mass recovery? Yeah, we, we, like, uh, we, we checked the, the, the total mass of bromides that we infiltrated, and we uh, almost uh, abstracted the same, the same, uh, same uh, concentration. Okay. Yeah. There's a question here to the front. What, 
what we are uh, typical values of average Darcy velocity in, in layer one, two, three, and what were the values of dispersivity uh, so which you selected? Um, good question, but uh, I don't think I can answer that right now, but I can maybe uh, search it up and uh, we can discuss that later. Uh, thank you, Emil. Interesting uh, presentation. Um, you were referring to maybe not wanting to um, infiltrate in particular layers, uh, probably because of pyrid oxidation having uh, negative consequences. Um, have you considered injecting without nutrients? Because f it's known that phosphate inhibits uh, pyrite uh, oxidation, so actually uh, the presence of phosphate might uh, help um, uh, mitigate the, uh, the the pyrite oxidation. Is that something you consider? Um, if I don't answer it right, uh, please please tell me. Uh, but the, the the water that we that we uh, infiltrate was uh, the, s the same composition or as as as, uh, as similar as possible as the water that we would normally uh, collect from the drainage system. So we try to 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 keep. Yeah, the concentration is similar as the drainage water that we normally would infiltrate in the, the ASR system. So that's why we choose for, for, for this composition. Is that a answer yeah, it's clear. question? Yes, clear. It's, it's clear now. Yes. Green. Thank you, Emil. Very nice. You mentioned the uh, advantages for, uh, for using these push pool tests, but can you also elaborate on, on potential uh, drawbacks or disadvantages of, of the technique for, for MAR exploration? Yeah, I, I, th I think. Um, for, for exploration, the, 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 the main disadvantage is that we, um, we like the microbial community in, in the ASR system we will change over time. So I'm, I'm uh, like the, like for explora exploration, you could, uh, I think, best use, use the push-pull test to, to look at the chemical reactions and maybe uh, to a lesser extent to, to biochemical uh, reactions. I think that's the main drawback for exploration. Okay. I